someone has just been healed of cancer, stomach cancer. The tumor fell to the platform. I mean, it fell to the platform. That's we saw it was something else, and it broke in pieces right. uh, as it hit the stage. But I believe certain demons have come into America through this new group of people coming in from Haiti and from all these countries, bringing their devils with them. Benny Hinn has built himself into a kind of one-man multinational religious conglomerate. It's estimated his ministry brings in more than $200 million a year, mostly based on his pledge that you will be healed if you have enough faith, and especially if you attend his crusades. You see, this is the way that it works. Bullshit artists get to keep spreading their bullshit if it's unchallenged. If there really was a global flood that covered the highest hills under the whole of heaven, as the Bible describes, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And actually what we find are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Despite this relentless propagandizing, the American people are, are just not buying it. You know, the same thing has happened with creation evolution. Uh, the American public has been propagandized for over 100 years with evolution, and still 40% of the American people believe that man was created substantially as he is today by God about 6,000 years ago. Yeah, if it's unchallenged, they get to keep spreading their bullshit unchallenged. This is universally true, no matter what you're talking about, whether it's solar roadways, faith healing, homeopathy, or whatever. The minimum that you need is for someone, preferably competent, to go through and in some cases do the most superficial research, like watching a few playthroughs of a computer game. And in some cases, doing more detailed calculations like the energy required to stop the Earth or the energy required to melt all of the snow in America. And then bring that all together into something that's fun to watch. And if no one does this, they get to keep pimping their bullshit unchallenged, and people will inevitably get sucked in and duped by it. Has anyone seen this video for Summer Freaking Roadways? Yeah! Yeah! I have seen the future, and it is Solar Freaking Roadways. Yeah! Panels in our streets with sensors that can know if someone's crossing the street ahead of you with lights, so it lights up, it says, careful, there's an animal, there's a kid, there's a pedestrian. Parking lots that can change their minds. Heaters in them, so you never have to worry about snow plows anymore. <laughs> I watched a very interesting little video that said, if a 15% efficient solar panel was put onto every roadway in the United States of America, we would be the power brokers for the entire planet. <laughs> and it's free! That excites me. I mean, for me, that stuff is just painful to watch. It really is just painful to see someone who's not only been completely duped by these empty promises themselves. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help but believes them so much that they're happy to pimp them out to a room full of cheering sci-fi type fans. Has anyone seen this video for summer freaking roadways? Yeah! But the bullshit isn't something that can just deceive people. Asian teacher Sandy Klein is crying because she says the end of the world means her daughters won't be able to have children of their own. And it's like you have no control over anything. It's all in the Lord's hands. The group believes that everyone who is saved will be taken into heaven May 21st. We're at a point now where we are so certain that this will happen, that we are ready to, you know, you know, travel 18 hours, leave our jobs, whatever. It does. We know. But the bullshit isn't something that can just deceive people. It can also rot away the ability of an organization to be effective. And that's why feminism first came to my attention, because it really has been poisoning atheism over the past few years. Such that now that you get prominent feminists like Rebecca Watson bobbleheading away as someone calls Dawkins, Dennett, Harrison, Hitchens, white supremacists. So these are all things that need to be looked at in terms of the institutionalization of atheist scholarship um, as a canon that is accepted within a certain segment of mainstream America now. We have obviously the four horsemen of apocalypse model 
um, you know, superstar white male atheists that have institutionalized a very narrow prescriptive white supremacist um, patriarchal version of atheism. Yeah, this is what you can expect from a women in secularism conference and miss white supremacy there. You know, the one who somehow managed to overlook the long list of academic achievements and best-selling books simply so she could attribute the success of the horsemen to their skin color and gender. She was named Secular Woman of the Year by the group Secular Women. And just so you know, this conference was organized by, yeah, you guessed it, Melody Hensley from the Center for Inquiry. And yeah, that's the same Melody Hensley who claimed that she got post-traumatic stress disorder from Twitter, and then tried to get a soldier fired by contacting their commanding officer because they wouldn't believe that she got PTSD from Twitter. And now you can see what happens when these Muppets hold the reign of power at conventions. I mean, let's just take a look at the uh, about section. Hmm. Uh, about a hundred words. Okay, that's great. Now let's take a look at the conduct policy. Two thousand words. Yet this great list of do's and don'ts that's twenty times longer than the description of the conference, which includes a great list of things that you should and shouldn't do in the event of a shooting. Take action against the shooter. This is the least preferable option. Be loud and aggressive. Commit to a decision and do not hesitate. Do the greatest possible damage in the least time. That's great to know that Skepticon is taking such a valiant stance against conference shootings. But kind of oddly out of character. I mean, personally, I would have expected them to all be holding up their Tumblr signs saying, don't tell me how to avoid being shot at conferences. Tell them not to shoot victims. Oh, oh hang on. No, wait, hang on. I'm following through the social justice warrior reasoning. What the hell is wrong with these sexists? They have a policy against shooting people, but don't have a policy against rape. What, so rape is not important to these people? I mean, it can't be because they've got a policy against shooting, but not one against rape. And when they add their no raping clause to their conference policy, just to prove they're good allies who think that rape is bad. Did you guys know that rape is bad? Rape is bad. Does anybody know this? Make sure that, just like they have plenty of advice on how to minimize your risks of getting shot, that they have plenty of advice on how to minimize their risks of being raped. You know, like Thunderfoot did in those videos of his. Oh no, wait, no, no, that made him a rape apologist. So, yeah, this is right, this policy giving advice on how to minimize their risks of being shot is actually blaming the people who get shot for not for not being fast enough. This conference policy is stating that those who actually get shot invited it and deserved it for not being fast enough. A conference policy so well written that yes means yes, no means no, and maybe means no. Remember, maybe means no. It's in the conference policy. Dear God, let me say this one last time for the socially retarded social justice warriors out there. Most communication to do with sex is done through body language. The grammatical use of words is almost irrelevant compared to how they're said. No can mean yes. Yes can mean no. And maybe can mean definitely. Look, it isn't rocket science. Sex has been around for hundreds of millions of years. Communication through sound is measured in the tens of millions of years, but communication through grammar is measured in the tens of thousands of years. Of course, most sexual communication is done through non-grammatical means. It's biologically hardwired into you at the genetic level. <laughs> yeah, damn straight, maybe can mean definitely. But coming back to the um, uh, conference policy, you can be thrown out for discriminating against someone's religion. You know, like saying that women shouldn't have to wear the burqa. 
But curiously, you won't be thrown out for threatening someone with a gun. It's just you won't be welcome to return to future events. This sort of thing is poisoning atheism, and it's taken root in some pretty unlikely places. Places I just wouldn't believe unless I'd seen them with my own eyes. I often say if you're not a feminist, then you're a bigot. I mean, there is nothing in between. If you are not a feminist, you are a sexist. I mean, this sort of rot is turning the atheist community into Tumblr. Indeed, arguably, Atheism Plus was an unholy union between atheism and Tumblr. And we all know what happens when all those precious snowflakes from Tumblr get together. You get a conference where the organizers ask for $17,000 on the very first day because they were too incompetent. Anything helps for us to stay here until the rest of the weekend. Unless everyone in this room can accumulate $17,000. That's right. One, seven, and three zeros. Team right now, so in theory, you're just three grand short. Still Lord! These kids want this con. I say give it to them. And then, as a reward for all of their screw-ups, they offer the conference goers an extra hour in the ball pit. Seriously, that's the ball pit that they were offered an extra hour in. The ball pit was later urinated in. Yeah, if no one fights it, not only will your community be infected, but that infection will spread. Spread, it seems, by people with communication degrees. You know, like Anita Sarkeesian and Rebecca Watson. Ah, yes, the communications degree, the intellectual heavyweight of our time. Oh, your playing days are over, my friend. But you can always fall back on your degree in communications. Oh, dear Lord. I know. It's funny, Major. <laughs> Lucheco learned nothing. Nothing! <laughs> and that's pretty much the way that it worked with Anita Sarkeesian in gaming. Sure, you only have to scratch the surface to realize just how full of shit she is. Else you're just going to get commenters like the Huffington Post fawning over how terribly persecuted she is, or, or this PPS game commenter. But when Anita Sarkeesian publishes a laundry list of horrible things sent to her on Twitter, suddenly we understand what the problem is and who is actually suffering. That's why the New York Times, New Statesman, and Ted all took notice when Sarkeesian became a target. The issue of sexism in games finally had someone, not an avatar, as its spokesperson. And that's what all great social movements need, attention from the outside world and a voice to help them humanize the problem. You're left with a single question, why did this happen in the first place? In the 70s, Polish social psychologist Henry Tajafel coined the term in-group favoritism, meaning we tend to favor people who we believe to be part of our group because those groups give us self-esteem and identity. Oh no, please don't suggest that Anita Sarkeesian gets the flack that she does because of tribalism, and she doesn't get the flack because she's talking crap. Don't go there. Don't go there. But what happens when someone from the outside comes along and tells you that something's wrong with you and your group? What would you do? You'd stand up and defend your tribe. Tajifal had a term for that impulse too. It's called outgroup derogation, and it means that you perceive those outside your group as a threat. And that's exactly what Carolyn and Anita are. A threat. Why? Because they're women. And you, sir, Mr. PBS Game Show, are a moron. I mean, let me break this down for you in simple terms. Anita Sarkeesian gets the grief that she does because her arguments are facepalm stupid. You know, like claiming that women are institutionally oppressed in almost every facet of their lives. Women are being institutionally oppressed all the time in nearly every facet of our lives. Or that she thinks that the fact that men are on average stronger than women is actually a myth. The belief that women are somehow a naturally weaker gender is a deeply ingrained socially constructed myth, which of course is completely false. Or she thinks this. While it may be comforting to think that we all have a personal force field protecting us from outside influences, this is simply not the case. Scholars sometimes refer to this type of denial as the third person effect, which is the tendency for people to believe that they are personally immune to media's effects, even if others may be influenced or manipulated. Paradoxically, and somewhat ironically, those who most strongly believe that media is just harmless entertainment are also the ones most likely to uncritically internalize harmful media messages. In short, the more you think you cannot be affected, the more likely you are to be affected. It really, it's like homeopathy. The more you think it doesn't affect you, the more it affects you. 
I mean, think about that. The next time you watch Silence of the Lambs. And that's exactly what Carolyn and Anita are. A threat. Why? Because they're women. It's not because she's a woman. It's because she's an idiot. An idiot taken seriously by many, particularly in the mainstream media, who couldn't do a few minutes of simple fact-checking. You know, like yourself. I mean, really, the only way this could get more stupid is if you were to say, claim that stating the fact that she's not a gamer. So it's not exactly a fandom. I'm not a fan of video games. I actually had to learn a lot about video games in the process of making this. And also video games, like I would love to play video games, but I don't want to go around shooting people and ripping off their heads and it's just gross. It's comparable to the segregation of pre-civil rights movement America. Oh wait, he does? And yet, a subset is attacking these women to draw a false line around who can and can't wear the gamer badge. Hmm. This reminds me of something. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Okay, at this point, I've just got a grim sense of foreboding about this. Please, 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 please don't compare Anita Sarkeesian to Rosa Parks. According to sociologist Neil Smelzer, all social and political movements need something called an initiating event. There has to be a spark, something to push the issue out into the forefront. And many times that initiating event is marked to a person. Rosa Parks became the symbol of discrimination during the civil rights era. But what Parks, Milk, Steinem, and now Sarkeesian did... No! No! Oh, please, God, no! 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 But in this sense, you do have a point. Movements do need an instigating event. However, I think you'll find that, in the long game, Anita Sarkeesian really hasn't done for women in gaming what Rosa Parks did for the civil rights movement. I think she's done more for women in gaming what the Hindenburg did for hydrogen lift zeppelins. I mean, let's be real. If the sexism in games was really there, why would you have to outright lie to people's faces about it? Or game developer conferences giving her awards for how terribly brave she is in deconstructing video games as a pop culture critic. You know, people who didn't even do those 20 minutes of background checking. Look, Anita Sarkeesian is basically a female clone of Jack Thompson. Somebody call Jack Thompson. And it makes him an object of scorn in the gaming world. Kids who wear I Hate Jack Thompson t-shirts can trade blows with his likeness in the game Mortal Kombat. The difference is, when someone says that they hate Jack Thompson, no one cares. When someone says they hate Anita Sarkeesian, it's all, oh no, look what terrible problem gaming has with sexism. We should give her an award or something for being so terribly brave about this. It's poison. And unless someone takes the time to tackle this bullshit, it will spread and it'll transform your movement from one that has big hitters at its core to a chorus of whiny professional victims in less time than it takes a tumblerite to urinate in the ball pit. And for those who might have some lingering doubts about how Anita can clearly be shown to be so full of shit on gaming and still get an award for being so terribly brave from a gaming convention, you should watch this video by the internet aristocrat about journalism in gaming. I mean, it started the same way it did in secularism, with a bunch of pious social justice warriors coming in and saying, no, the gaming industry shouldn't be about gaming. That would be silly. It should be about talking how oppressed I am. And anyone who wants to talk about gaming rather than how oppressed I am is a misogynist. You hate women. And just how evil you are for hating women is the only thing that the gaming community needs to discuss. And I can always rely on old media to just take my word for it and not do their homework and just print how horrifically sexist you are for not wanting the gaming community to be about how oppressed I am. Well, it turns out the Rebecca Watson equivalent of indie gaming is called Zoe Quinn. 
And of course, she's one of those mm, social justice feminist sorts of the ilk that infidelity is basically a violation of consent. And therefore, infidelity is rape. Well, turns out she was cheating on her boyfriend with almost anyone who could further her career, including her married boss. And yes, curiously after this, her text-based came about combating depression, inventively called Depression Quest, got onto Greenlight Steam. She released a game on Steam called Depression Quest, and reading the description it states, it is a flash text-based adventure game about a person living with depression and how situations affect them. Who doesn't want to play a game about being fucking depressed? I rank that right up there with gems like I Have the Chicken Pox and the hit sequel I Have Shingles Now, Oh God Does It Hurt! And, of course, all of those video game journalists she was sleeping with curiously wrote positive things about her on larger gaming blogs. Incestuously corrupt and intergalactic hypocrisy in one package. Yeah, social justice warriors are basically Ted Haggard. You know, remember that homosexuality thing? It's only bad when other people do it. Or more aptly, it's only sexist when men do it. (laughs) Now excuse me while I have sex with this journalist who's writing a piece about how incredibly stimulating my social justice warrior game about depression is. Or how he should badmouth my competition. Or while I abuse copyright law to take down legitimate criticism of me on YouTube. Yeah, let me just wrap this up by saying this really isn't my first choice of subject for making videos. There are many things that I would rather be doing, but to a large degree, you get the community that you deserve. And if no one's going to call bullshit on this bullshit, or their abuses of power, or their professional victimhood, or incompetence, one day you'll just turn around and the community you know won't be there anymore. It will have been devoured by corruption and you'll be being represented by worthless professional whiners. And I, for one, am just not willing to sit by and watch that happen.